John, Paul, George, and Ringo. I, I mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No Ringo. No Ringo. Not the Fab Four from Liverpool, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four people that God chose to use to record the Gospels. Matthew, formerly Levi, he was a hated tax collector. Today he'd be like an IRS auditor. I bet you didn't send out any Christmas cards to your favorite IRS auditor. Um, Mark, also known as John Mark, was fired and then rehired by Paul. Um, the, the gospel was dictated to him by Peter, so when you read Mark, you're actually reading Peter. Luke was the only known Gentile author, uh, a physician. And then John, John the Beloved, who repeatedly called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, writes his gospel from a very different vantage point. But what about Paul? Uh, pa Paul wrote a third of the New Testament. He wrote 13 out of the 27 books in the New Testament. Um, but did he write a biology of Jesus? Did, did he write a gospel? Well, no. But he did write about Christmas. Mo Paul most definitely wrote about the incarnation. Today's message is called Emptied to be Exalted. Open your Bible today to Philippians chapter 2. Paul most often refers to Jesus as Christ or Christ Jesus rather than Jesus Christ or Jesus because that's how Paul came to know him. Paul had the original road to Damascus moment and in his own words, he met Jesus as one born out of time. He met Jesus in his resurrected and ascended and glorified state. He met him as the Christ. He met him as God the Son. Not in the days of his flesh. Not as Jesus of Nazareth. He met him as deity and came to know his humanity. And you'll see that on display in Paul's incarnation declaration. Uh, many scholars believe that what we're about to read is actually one of the first hymns sung in the Christian church. Uh, it's, it's a topic of debate, but many believe what we're about to read is a New Testament psalm. Uh, they believe that Paul inserted this into his letter, and that would mean that we actually have a glimpse into what worship songs were like from the resurrection of Jesus till when Paul wrote to the Philippians about 30 years later. We get to see what worship was like in those 30 years. Now that also means that the early church had some potent lyrics in their hymns. They weren't singing jingles. They, 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 they weren't concerned about the hook and marketing. They, listen, the content of their worship was deep. It was transcendent. It was nuanced and powerful. But even if what we're about to read is not a psalm, if it's not a song inserted by Saul, if it just came directly uh, from God the Holy Spirit, uh, breathed through Paul, well, this is the Acropolis. This is the pinnacle of what's known as Christological passages for Paul. Uh, imagine what we're about to get a glimpse into is the very mindset of God. It's one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. We'll read it through and then we'll come back and we'll unpack. I want us to read it aloud together today. Ready? Philippians chapter 2 will begin at verse 5. Ready? Let's read. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The breadth and the depth of these seven verses are pun intended epic. 
speaks of Christ's pre-existence, his equality with God, his identity with humanity, the costly nature of the hypostatic union that he was fully human and fully God. It speaks of Jesus' submission to the will of the Father, his vicarious death, his exaltation, and then all of creation's submission to the authority of his name. It's the gospel. It is the life of Jesus in seven verses. Incarnation, humiliation, exaltation. But it starts with, let this mind be in you. The original word for mind here is phroneo, and it means to be wise or to think. The phrase here is actually hotus phroneo, this think. What you see in Jesus In in, in his humble birth, in his obedient life, in his voluntary death, in his subsequent hyper-exaltation, let this mind, let this wisdom, this way of thinking, this worldview, this attitude, paradigm, mindset, let this be in you. Which makes us ask the question, if Tozer is right and what you think about God is the most important thing about you, then how is your mind set? What is it set on? Is it set on self or set on others? Colossians tells us to set our mind on things above and not on things on the earth. Like maybe it's time to hit reset. Because the very first thing that Paul, under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit is telling us is the principles we see in the life of Jesus are practically applicable. They don't just work on Sunday mornings. They they work Monday through Saturday. They work at work. They work in the marketplace, in your marriage. The, The vertical principles all work in all of your horizontal relationships. Let this mind be in you. You can and should apply the principles to every part of your everyday life. For instance, for instance, like no room at the inn. Well, what's the practical implication of that? Well, make room for Jesus in your heart. Don't let the world uh, crowd him out. Shepherds, what could be the practical application of that? God reveals extraordinary mysteries to ordinary people, so always look for the extraordinary in your ordinary. You can practically apply that. The Magi, the wise men, practical application, ready? Wise people still give him their best gifts. And the king of kings in a stable, in a feeding trough, what would the personal application be, the practical application? Well, that's how much God loves you. Listen, you could never get to heaven by yourself. God had to come and get you. And as you go about your day during this season, every time you see a nativity, let it be a reminder of the lengths that God went to to rescue you because he loves you. Like if you can remind yourself every day, throughout your day, if you let this mind be in you when you're in a tight place or when you're down or when you're facing a challenge or you're scared or discouraged, if you will remind yourself that you are loved by the one who's got the whole world in his hands, that you are inseparably and unchangeably loved by the only sovereign God, it will change your life in huge and wonderful ways. So let's break down every facet of this theological gem. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. Now the word form there is not synonymous for image or likeness. How many of you know we're created in the image and likeness of God, but Jesus was the form of God? The word form there in Greek is the word morphe, which means the essential nature of a thing. That which truly characterizes a given reality. Here's how the Amplified Bible puts it. Who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God. And in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, for in him, in Christ Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Like, let that sink in. As you let that sink in, let's just settle it. 
right? He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a good man. Those options aren't on the table because if Jesus is not who he said he was, if he was not telling the truth when he said, before Abraham was, I am, if he was not telling the truth when he said, he who has seen me has seen the Father, if he was lying when he said, I and the Father are one, listen to me, then he's not a good teacher. He's not a good man. You've heard the argument. He is either a lunatic a liar or he is Lord the babe in the manger is the great I am the babe in Bethlehem is Emmanuel God with us the babe in Bethlehem is God the son baby Jesus was mighty God infant newborn wrapped in swaddling clothes Jesus was everlasting father it is the miracle of Christmas Paul, by the Spirit, could not use any stronger language to convey Christ's full equality with God. That he was God who was by choice living out a truly human life. You see, the first thing I'd like to point out to you in practically applying this magnificent work of theology in our everyday lives is this. Ready? You've got to know who you are. I said, you've got to know who you are. Now, this chapter certainly talks about the humility, uh, about humility and having the heart of a servant. But how many of you know those things are best done from a position of strength? Humility isn't weakness. Serving others isn't weakness. Meekness isn't weakness. All of those attributes are actually expressions of strength under control. For instance, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, just before the Last Supper, just as he was getting a towel and a basin to wash disciples' gnarly feet, John's Gospel says just before he did that, it says that Jesus knew his hour had come. He knew that he was departing from this world. He knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. He knew that he had come from God and was going to God. So before the Lord ever filled that bowl, before he ever donned the towel, before he bent down and unloosened even one sandal strap, listen, before he left us an example of humility and servitude, he had a first firm grip, complete clarity on, on his identity. He had no need to prove anything to anyone. He had no need to impress. Jesus knew who he was. And you've got to know who you are. My family, listen to me carefully today. If you are a believer in Jesus, you are the head and not the tail, above only and never beneath. You're blessed in the city and you're blessed in the country. You're blessed when you go out. You're blessed when you come in. The love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. You have the very mind of Christ. You're a new creature in Christ. Your body is the temple of the living God. Are you hearing me? You've got power in the name of Jesus. You're a co-heir with Christ. You're an heir of God and a co-heir with Christ you got to know who you are and then serve from a position of strength. Let's look at the whole verse. Verse 6, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. There it is again, equal with God. God from God, true God from true God, begotten, not made. But what a mysterious phrase, right? Did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, without getting too lost in the weeds here uh, with with, with Greek definitions and grammar, the New Revised Standard Version captures this really well. Verse 6, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. You see, it wasn't enough to show us what Equality with God was and is. God wants you to know what equality with him is not. Paul's emphasis here is that equality with God did not consist of Christ being a grasping opportunist. What's being said here is that the pre-existent Christ, 
being the co-equal second member of the triune Godhead, did not consider his divine attributes, his, his omniscience as God, his omnipresence as God, his omnipotence as God. He did not consider his rights and privileges as God something to be seized upon, grasped, or taken advantage of. This illustration is a stretch. But we sometimes get ladybugs in the house. We do, we get ladybugs. Every once in a while, a couple times a year, ladybugs, specifically in the kitchen. Just like one or two. And sometimes they'll be in a really bad place. You just kind of leave them there for a little bit. Kitchen is completely white, so you can see the little red with the black dots. You want to see how many dots they have. Supposedly, that's how old they are. All that kind of stuff. But, but the truth of the matter is, I have every right, and I have every right, all authority, and all power to crush the ladybug. That's my house. It's not the ladybug's house. It's my house. Right? I'm bigger. I'm more powerful. I could just crush every ladybug that comes in. But I don't crush the ladybugs. You want to know why? I think Pastor Lane and I, we like the ladybugs. We might even love the ladybugs. So you, you, just, you, just, you, just wait, you just put your finger there, crawls on your finger, you go to the back, you open the door, and you free willy, right? That's what you do. You just let them go. Well, I, I didn't exercise my rights and privileges as a homeowner, as a human being. I didn't exercise those. Why? I don't mean it would be messier to crush the bug anyway. But anyway, what I'm saying is, if you have supervisory responsibility, like if you have oversight, if you have a managerial position, let's say, or maybe you're a small business owner, know this, God gave it to you, number one. God gave you that position. He gave you that business. Do right by him. And do right by the people who you have authority over. Pastor Lena always says, you want to know somebody's heart? Give them power. Right? Never use your authority to hurt anyone. To cause somebody pain. Do no harm. Use what God gave you to help somebody, to lift somebody, to be a blessing to somebody, to make somebody else's life better because you're in it, to stoop down and give somebody else a leg up. See, Christ Jesus was unwilling to use his divine rights and privileges for selfish purposes. Like, don't you think that Jesus could have just put an end to the mocking and the ridicule and the persecution and the lies? Don't you think that he could have just crushed Caesar and Herod and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes with, with like, he could have crushed them like a ladybug. He could, have, he could have just sent one little shower of hellfire and brimstone and they'd all be gone. He could have done, he told Peter, he said, put away your sword. Don't you think that I could call on my father and he would send more than 12 legions, more than 144,000 angels to rescue me? I have that kind of power. I have that kind of authority. And don't you think in his pre-incarnate glory, like don't you think that the Lord could have reserved a much more opulent birthing place? Rather than like a stanky stable wafting with malodorous stench of donkey dung? He could have. Some would say he should have. Right? Some would say, get him a Gucci bassinet. But he didn't. What did he do? Well, it's detailed for us in the ensuing verses. Who, being in the form of God. Did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a servant. The, the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version there, says taking upon him the form of a slave. And coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So from being the source of all life, to dying a criminal's death, from God to the similitude of a slave. He made himself of no reputation. The NIV there says he made himself nothing. 
The Amplified says he stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity. The NRSV says he emptied himself. See, the equality with God mindset is self-giving rather than self-serving. It means not grasping, but rather giving away. Probably the best translation for what the New King James has here as he made himself of no reputation is, ready, he poured himself out. When Christ left heaven and headed for a stone manger in the city of David, he poured himself out. When he walked this planet as the God-man, And he healed the sick and he cleansed the leper and he raised the dead and he fed the hungry and preached the good news to the poor and gave hope to everyone. Jesus did so by pouring himself out. And when he hung, suspended between heaven and earth, and he became a curse for us. Galatians says, cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. On Golgotha's hill, at the place of the skull, Jesus poured himself out, literally. He was God, the God who emptied himself, the God who poured himself out. Now think about that, personalize that. God poured himself out for me. Say that with me today. God poured himself out for me. God poured himself out for me. For God the Son, being God wasn't something to be grasped at seized upon, taken advantage of, leveraged. It wasn't a power to use to crush others with. It meant stepping into a sin-stained world that he so loved and pouring himself out to rescue it. My family, when somebody asks you for help, don't just do the bare minimum. Pour yourself out. When when you're given a project, a task at work, don't look for a shortcut. Pour yourself out. When, when, When God opens a door for you, don't just walk through it. Run through it and pour yourself out. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with thy might. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Listen, go the extra mile. Give the shirt off your back. And when you've gone the extra mile, go another mile and go another mile. Listen, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Pour yourself out. Man, you want to excel? Pour yourself out. Want to experience things you've never experienced before? Pour yourself out. Like nobody wants to hear why you can't. Nobody wants to hear your negativity. Nobody wants to hear your woe is me. Nobody wants to hear your excuses. Like maybe the reason why you're in the shape that you're in is because you've sown the seeds of selfishness and self-centeredness for so long that now you have to reap the harvest and eat the rotten fruit your me-first attitude produced. That was worth the price of admission right there. He who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Maybe you need to repent today. Maybe you need to change the way you think today and start thinking if God's mindset is self-giving and not self-serving, if God could humble himself, if God could take the form of a servant, if God could empty himself and pour himself out, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. You, you, you may have some apologizing to do today, this afternoon, but, 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 but listen, you can start this today. You can start this at the house today or tomorrow at work. And listen, here, the reason why you should, the reason why you should humble yourself and serve, the reason why you should pour yourself out, the best motive is simply because that's what Jesus did for you. Like that should be enough. That that alone should, at the same time, melt our hearts and ignite our hearts to compassionate action. 
That, that should be motivation enough to let this mind be in you. But how many of you know with God, there's always more? I said with God, there's always more. How many of you know he's the God of more than enough? So there are always benefits. Massive benefits. Now we don't do it for the benefits. Otherwise your motives would be all jacked up. But we are also admonished to forget not all his benefits. Like, like, like we don't give to get. But how many of you know that getting's good? Right? And we thank God for it and we give God all the glory for it. You can't help to get when you give because God is perfect self-giving love and he'll never let you outgive him. So we're going to conclude with, 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 with a vindication statement that is the high water mark of Paul's letter in verse 9. Therefore, we're about to find out what it's there for. God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. My family, understand this. You can never earn or deserve anything from a holy God. And if you think you can, you just proved why you can. But the good news is, you don't have to because Jesus did. Jesus did earn, deserve, merit every title, every position, all power, and every blessing. And then he freely gave it to you. Then he freely deposited that into your account. Therefore, because, because Jesus emptied himself, because he poured himself out, therefore, in humility and service, obedience unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, 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 God has hooper upsao, has, has hyper exalted him, exalted his name above every name, conferred upon him the title of Lord of heaven and earth. How many of you know he is Lord of the things in heaven, of the things in earth and things under the earth? Jesus is sovereign king over the whole of created beings. Angels, demons, humans, every created being. All will bow the knee. All will confess. Even his enemies. Even the devil himself will bow his horns and his hooves. Because of Christ's incarnation and voluntary humiliation, because the Son of God's condescension and crucifixion, because He didn't come to be served, but He came to serve and give His life a ransom for many, listen, there will be exaltation. There will be resurrection. There will be ascension to the throne at the right hand of the Father. And the practical application... It's found in the words of another eyewitness, Peter, who wrote, Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. With God, the way up is the way down. With God, we descend into greatness. And like we could talk about God putting his hand upon you and exalting you by way of a promotion at work or an increase in pay or, or, or a better position with better perks or a bigger house and a better car. We could. We could talk about that. We could talk about physical and material increase, blessing and exaltation, and we would not be wrong. God does care about your physical and material well-being. There are a plethora of promises around those things. And to deny that is to say you got a better idea than the Bible. But just like it says in 3 John 2, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. In all things, that word pos is there. That means all things. That you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. See, I want to go a little deeper today and see what that looks like. 
What, 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 what it looks like to adopt a mindset of serving and sh- uh, from strength, not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. What it looks like to empty yourself of self. What it looks like to pour yourself out. To let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And therefore have God do something on the inside of you where it matters most, by the way. Just, just as your soul, that word there is suke, where we get the word psyche. So where, where your psyche prospers. Because how many of you know if you're prospering on the inside, you can't help but prosper on the outside. I'm just going to say it again. If you're prospering on the inside, you can't help but prosper on the outside. Right? It's like saying, I'm going to dive into the water, but I don't want to get wet. Listen, if you dive into the deep end of a relationship with God, you will get soaked with blessing. But I think the best application, rather than kind of detail what this might look like for you, I think the best way that this would be communicated today is by telling a true story of a taxi cab driver uh, before the days of Uber and lift. His name is Tony. Uh, he drove his cab on the night shift. So he would start each night with his cab at 2.30 a.m. Um, he said his cab became a moving confessional because all kinds of people would get in and tell him all kinds of things. And lots of times, because he drove that late at night, he says, you know, it was to pick up people who were partying somewhere and didn't want to drive, or pick up a spat between lovers, or, or pick up somebody who was going in early to a, a job in the industrial part of, uh, of the town. But on this night, as soon as he got in the cab, he got dispatched to a, a quadplex, four kind of townhouses together, uh, 2.30 in the morning in a very quiet part of town. When he got there, all the lights were off on all four of those homes, except one light in one little room. So he pulled up to the curb and he beeped. He says, you know, most taxi cab drivers, they beep once, maybe they'll beep twice, but if somebody doesn't come, then they're gone. He said he never wanted to do it that way, because you never knew. You never know if somebody couldn't hear. You never knew if somebody needed help. As long as there wasn't danger involved, he was going to get out of his his cab and go to the front door and ring the doorbell, and so he did. And when he did, the door was answered by a little, tiny, frail, 80-something-old woman. Really dressed up. Dressed up beautifully. She had even a little pillbox hat with a little veil on it. Like she was right out of the 40s. He peeked in to see where the light was on and saw a room that looked like nobody ever lived there. There was no pictures or paintings or clocks on the wall. He did see a box that they were accumulating in in the corner. All of the furniture was covered. She said to him, can you help me with my bag? He said, absolutely, ma'am. And he took her bag and said, oh, you're so kind, you're so kind. He said, no, no, no. It's not that I'm so kind. I just think like, how do I want my mother to be treated? He said, and so she looked at him and said, you're such a good boy. They went to the car. He put his bag in. She gave him the address of where she wanted him to take her. But she said to him, can you, can, can you go by downtown first? He says, well, I can. It's longer. It's longer. It's not the shortest way. She says, that's okay. I don't really have to get anywhere real quickly because the address I gave you was to hospice. They say I don't have much longer. With that, he shut off his meter. He said, ma'am, where do you want to go? And they went all over town. They went to her elementary school. They went to her high school. They went to the place that she first got her first kiss. It's now an appliance warehouse, but it used to be a dance hall. And then sometimes she would just ask him to pull over, and they would say nothing, and she'd just stare out the window and get welled up. As the sun began to come up, she looked at him and said, I'm tired now. We can go. And so he drove her to hospice, took her bag out. They were waiting for her. They came and they got her. Before he knew it, they had her seated in a wheelchair. And when he got her bag, he turned around. He said he didn't really even think about it all. He just knew was to just come down and give her a hug. And and she hugged him back so hard, so long, and kept saying, you're such a good boy. 
You're such a good boy. When Tony tells the story, here's what he says. He says, it was the most important life of my night, uh, night of my life. It was also the most fulfilling experience I've ever had on the job. Oh, by the way, she tried to pay him. He said, no, I won't. She said, you got to make a living. He said, there's plenty of other cabs, plenty of other passengers. I'll make money. So it wasn't about the money. It wasn't about anything really other than turning off his meter, laying down his evening, and giving it to somebody to make maybe one of their last memories something special. It was so that somebody else's life could be even just a little bit better because Tony was in it. And what he received back, yeah, it wasn't a new cab. It wasn't a big tip. It wasn't that. It was something so much more valuable. Joy. Right? Joy. Something that is independent of outward circumstances. Something that bubbles up way down deep on the inside. A sense of satisfaction that you can get nowhere else. Joy. My family, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant and came in the likeness of man and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself further and became obedient even to the death on the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. My family, the way up is the way down. And if you'll pour yourself out into other people's lives, you'll have joy on the inside that you've never, ever had before. Amen? Stand with me if you would.